because I remember things like um, paint, doing my damnedest to paint an imitation of a psychedelic poster and blasting music at the same time. And that, uh, so I was growing up in Baltimore. And for me, some of the most stimulating art was psychedelic posters and the illustrations in the uh, <laughs> New York Times book review section. My dad used to get the Sunday Times and there would be, a, you know, the various illustrators would do uh -huh. things that were sometimes vaguely surreal or clever or whatever. And it was that, <laughs> that and the psychedelic posters blew my mind. <clears throat> and I remember uh, I was also, you know, playing a guitar and doing that kind of thing at the time, but then I also remember uh, doing kind of primitive tape loop experiments and things like, you know, primitive, uh, imitating kind of John Cage type things of cutting up tape and pasting it back together again, um, making various loops of feedback and layering them up. And uh, there was, I think, a feeling that all these, all those kind of things are fair game and legitimate, and and everything. All that was kind of cool. It never became. It, nothing was. Oh, that's not. All of it can, was a fair, what grist for the mill, and could be incorporated into pop culture. That was the feeling in the air that that's, that that was okay. There was a feeling that this, that kind of um, inclusionary feeling of throwing, that you can make anything out of anything was all right. It, was, it kind of got the thumbs up. Like, uh, and, and that was like, what year are we talking about? This, this is, is when you were early, in high school? Yeah, or? so this is like, late 60s or early 70s so what kind of stuff were you listening to then or uh... it was a uh, again it was kind of a mixture of bands uh, whether it was Jimi Hendrix or Cream or uh, James Brown or you could also get other records out of the library. So you'd have like a in the same stack or a Stockhausen record or Zanakis or uh, Balinese Gamelan or all that kind of stuff. So then, so then, let's go to go to uh, art school. Your painting or your sculpting or what's happening? I didn't paint much of, uh, eventually started playing around with video stuff. Uh, eventually I started, it was more conceptual. And eventually I started doing things like um, questionnaires and that I would mail out or hand out. What would they say? They were on different subjects. One was on UFOs. And that was a, that had boxes, I think, that you would check. And another one was about the various states of the United States. That was kind of frivolous. <laughs> frivolous questions like, which state has the best shape? <laughs> they were things that I thought about. <laughs> and, uh, I did other things like Polaroids, fake Polaroids of, uh, UFOs, you could doctor them. Um, again, I think 
uh, I was attracted to these things that in a way didn't seem like art. Uh, they could, they could ins insinuate themselves or disguise themselves in some ways as just being part of the, part of the world out there. Um, that, and uh, in the same way that music can have that quality of just being on the radio or yeah. blasting out of somebody's record player. I remember shooting things of uh, pictures of I did one series where I had all these different people talk about television and talk about their favorite program, but I had each person talk about it in a different language. So it was like a Japanese woman talking about television in Japanese and somebody else talking in German. And of course, nobody could understand it all, but you would just hear these words like, a dating game. <laughs> <laughs> I liked the something about that I really liked. At one point, I, I was uh, in a band or a duo with another guy. I played ukulele and violin, and he played accordion. Um, and we would sometimes play on the street or for money, and sometimes at art parties, sometimes on on a stage like a performance. Uh, so, yeah, kind of crossed over back and forth. While you were in school and then... Yeah, or this is maybe the year when I, I dropped out of school for a year, but I still kept making stuff and doing these performances or bumming around. So you traveled ar all around the country? Yeah, hitchhiked around. It was uh, fun. I remember at one point I stayed with some friends on a kind of hippie commune in Kentucky, and I bought a saxophone somewhere, and I really loved Captain Beefheart. So I would go out in the fields on this farm in Kentucky and just make all these atonal noises on a saxophone. and felt pretty good about it. When did the music become more important than the art, or why? Oh, it was kind of an accident. I remember uh, I got the offer to live here. A painter was moving to New York, said I could sleep on his floor if I helped him with sanding and sanding the floor and, you know, doing all that kind of stuff. Well, so for a while, I was doing kind of, I guess, again, this kind of conceptual art in New York uh, that I didn't know what I was going to do with, but I was pretty active, pretty busy working on it, typing away, and and it was all yeah, it was all written. It was hardly anything to look at. <laughs> and, uh, Various instructions. Yeah, it was all that. instructions. It was all these weird systems of how things would fit together. Um, but it was it was pretty much always slightly tongue in cheek. One was uh, like this thing, uh, those guys, those Russian guys, Komar and uh, Melamed did where they took like a pole and, and then to find out what kind of uh, painting people would like the, like the best and then they made that painting. And this, one of the things was kind of like that. I was inspired by the television Nielsen rating system that would presumably, although not really, deliver to people the kind of programs they most wanted to see. <laughs> and yeah. I thought, that's what, that's what the art world needs. <laughs> so it was kind of tongue-in-cheek, but, but done very straight-faced. But anyway, it seemed to be, a, at the same time I was writing songs and then eventually started rehearsing with some other friends from art school. And pretty soon, uh, after 
we you know learned a half an hour's worth of songs, whatever that would would be. We auditioned at the at CBGB's, which was just around the corner, and uh, pretty much after that, that became just people liked it. There was only 20 people there, but they kind of liked it enough that we just kind of put more and more energy into it. And so the, um, the typing kind of fell by the wayside. Besides, it seemed that the, the art was not going to get the instant gratification that uh, jumping on stage was, was going to give. Being fairly young, it seemed that a lot of artists that almost like there was, a, at that time, maybe not so much anymore, but at that time, it was almost like you had to wait uh, until you were of a certain age before you'd be taken seriously as an artist. Uh, not, not so as a musician. Like at that time, you, you weren't, there weren't whatever uh, artists in galleries that were in their early 20s. Later, very shortly yeah. afterwards, but at that time there weren't. It just seemed like, oh, you just got to wait until you're older, that kind of thing. There was that whole art school, Bauhaus, whatever, aesthetic of uh, stripping away all unessential decor and uh, decoration. and. Uh, all that got a, that kind of got imported from art maybe and got applied to music so there was the idea of okay no more drum solos no more long guitar solos uh, no colored lights on stage no um, no extraneous movement or gestures or histronics or anything like that uh, we're just going to present the core essence what it is, and uh, there's going to be no, no, uh, no artifice in that sense. Um, and a lot of those ideas were imported, I think, from minimalism. Yeah, minimalism, art school, bow, the kind of Bauhaus kind of teaching, which I guess was prevalent in art schools at that time, and. Uh, Kind of bogus, but because you can't not have artifice. You're getting on stage. <laughs> it's a artificial situation to begin with. But but it was kind of a, it made for a kind of weird kind of tension, like a, getting up on stage and deciding no. Uh, you're just going to wear, you know, it was a decision, we're just going to wear street clothes. We're going to wear whatever we would wear um, on the street, sitting at the bar, that's what we wear on stage. We don't change. Don't, we don't go into a dressing room and change. Um, we don't try to look like rock stars or, or adopt any kind of uh, archetypical musician, rock star, pop image, we just kind of look like the uh, kind of kids we are, get up there. But then as soon as you get up there, that becomes uh, a uniform, that becomes a look. As soon as you step on stage. I was very suspect of, of rock music that preached about um, whatever. Injustice or a better world, or any of those things, and I still am. Uh, so I felt like the politics was always very personal. It was about how do you, how do you, how do you relate one person with another, or how do you, you as a person relate to society? Do you fit or do you not fit? And all that becomes kind of political. Uh, Although I really loved, I loved the kind of stilted language of Marxism. 
I just that we it has <laughs> the weird word choice of words and grammar and uh, yeah, I'm not talking about these artists' work. Yeah, I'm talking about like the theoretical books and things that you would read and various writers and stuff. It all had the weirdest grammar and verbiage and and uh, weird lingo. Uh, whether it was French philosophers or somebody's uh, writing an art form or whatever, it became a kind of the, the, with a kind of the sound of those words became an end to itself. <laughs> yeah, some sort of incantation. Like yeah, yeah, it was like an incantation. Social. Uh, it didn't really do. It didn't really communicate. I, I don't think what it in 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 the way that it was communicating a um, an idea. It communicated by incantation, like a chant. So it became this kind of as you said, a religious thing rather than a um, rather than a direct communication. It kind of wasn't by design. I mean, I love a lot of pop culture, so that became part of the mix. And I always thought that, although some of the stuff is going to be pretty out and pretty fringe, occasionally the uh, the influences, the, the scales are going to tip, so that on some stuff it's going to sound pretty pop. Uh, there's always going to be that that element kind of informing even the out stuff. Um, which I never thought was, I mean I always thought that was a, a positive thing. I never thought that, uh, that it was something to avoid. I never thought that, say, mass acceptance was anything to avoid. It wasn't anything to court, but at the same time, it wasn't anything to be afraid of. Uh, I don't remember any moment realizing this is what, it, this is my work now. I just remember it took, it was taking up more and more of my time. <laughs> it was just one step after the next of what. Yeah, what to do tomorrow or next week? There was never any grand plan of. Uh, where things were going to go in a year's time. When uh, Talking Heads started, there wasn't, it wasn't called punk yet. Um, there was, Patti Smith would occasionally like read or chant or encamp poems and at that time sometimes she'd just play with Lenny Kay playing guitar, she'd kind of strumming chords behind her. Uh, and then gradually there'd be another musician, and eventually she had a whole band. Uh, but it started off as like a poetry reading with a, with a guitar with guitar strumming, and there were uh, their friends like te uh, television, whom I liked a lot. Uh, the Ramones, they played. Uh, and then there were a few kind of uh, more kind of pop bands at that time. I remember there was a band called the Marbles. There were some. There might have been these kind of doll spin-offs from the Dolls, uh, like the, either the Heartbreakers or or maybe that was in between. Uh, and occasionally there'd be like these fusion bands and things that didn't fit in to that to the image that one might have of that place at all. Uh, you know, a bunch of guys who had incredible chops, and they sounded like uh, I don't know Kansas or Sticks or Gentle Giant or some band that the rest of us had very, very little interest in. <laughs> but that was part of the mix, too. The, uh, <laughs> uh, I, rem well, um, the, I remember very shortly afterwards, then the, 
the, as the sequence as I remember was the, Ram the Ramones, uh, uh, went to London had, and played. Uh, Malcolm McLaren had seen uh, all the, a bunch of these bands. And that, all that kind of inspired the London scene to kind of do it yourself. If they, you know, if they can do it, then we can do it. And there it seemed much more, uh, much more cohesive. It seemed much more a movement, or at least uh, in terms of attitude and stance and style and record covers and the whole thing. Um, New York seemed real fractured. Everybody seemed to be really into their own thing. Uh, whereas England was presenting this kind of unified front. In England, yeah, there was the whole Everything, it was a whole package. Clothes, graphics, uh, catchphrases, um, t-shirts, music, the whole thing. The music was in some ways just a soundtrack to the whole thing. Um, the New Yorkers didn't quite get, didn't think in those terms. They thought of themselves as musicians or bands or poets or whatever, uh, but never thought in terms of that whole, that whole bigger picture. And after we made a record, it allowed us to, to play around, uh, we could play England and Paris and Amsterdam. We could also play Boston, Albany, and Pittsburgh. <laughs> Still couldn't play New Jersey, but... <laughs> Why not? Why not New Jersey? It was just, uh, at that time, there was just no venues. Uh, in Pittsburgh, we had to play in a pizza parlor. Um, in, in the clubs, were, there was no... This, the music was too new, so it didn't have a, have a place. You were some. You were playing in uh, clubs that really, you felt like. You were uh, that belonged to somebody else's music, and, it was, and uh, the whole vibe and the whole atmosphere seemed to be that you were intruding in somebody else's. Somebody else's space. You were. An, you really felt like an outsider. <clears throat> so like blues based, like. Yeah, it was just rock. Pretty much rock bands, or folk clubs, or whatever, and you were kind of, I, mean, I don't mean just talking heads, but any of these people just seemed like, uh, you know, we may as well have been from Mars. We weren't, the stuff we were doing wasn't that strange, but it was, it didn't have any, uh, the attitudes were completely different. And we, yeah, it wasn't, it didn't have any of those uh, references blues or folk or whatever, or at least they, those references were really slim. What were the influences on the music? Like I sometimes thought like I heard echoes of like, or ideas coming from like uh, Phil Glass maybe even. Or yeah, stuff like there was influences from minimal music, from uh, well, obviously things like Velvet Undergrounds and English, whatever, art rock bands from an earlier generation. And then stuff like, uh, what is James Brown or um, the, uh, Al Green or various, the kind of groove of, and the importance of the groove in a lot of R&B music. Booker T and the MGs, kind of minimal, minimalist R&B. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's great. I mean, I, I always thought that James Brown, some of the stuff from the uh, early 70s, I guess, early and mid 70s, was really radical music. Uh, it totally, uh, completely turned upside down 
the idea of pop song structure, what a pop song is, the idea of melody or chord changes, all those kind of givens were gone. They, they, in, uh, in who specifically? In, in James Jane. Brown's music. Uh, even the sounds were uh, in, in some ways radical. The guitar would sound like a piece of metal being hit, like and it didn't sound like uh, a melodic instrument at all. It was turned into a percussion instrument. Anyway. And that wasn't really happening in, in the sort of rock no, that Previous, wasn't that. Uh, as always in in uh, in America, there's this kind of racial divide, and so uh, rock found in, in many in many cases found its kind of radical inspirations elsewhere. You know, a lot of the people we were talked to at that from that time period really couldn't play anything. But you seem to be able to play. Just, well, I figured the same thing. I could play just enough. To, and and uh, I also realized that we well, don't have to play that, you know, have great chops. You just have to know, uh, know what your limitations are so that if you um, can only play two notes, uh, just play those in the right places. And you can really, really do something. But if you uh, if you think that, that you're obliged to write songs with three notes, then you've oh, you've kind of overreached, and you're you're going to look uh, you're going to look like you can't play. It's going to it's not going to work as well. So I think if you just kind of really limit yourself uh, in that way. It doesn't matter at all. Yeah, it was kind of a uh, this real healthy attitude of not not caring about craft too much. It became a kind of anti anti craft attitude as a result. Um, a lot of it came from yeah the excess of various guitar gods and things like that from the from the seventies. But it, it, I can see that, yeah. But then it get, later on, it seemed like you really got good. Like then it becomes a problem. That's the <laughs> that's the always the whatever the recurrent problem <coughs> when a band uh, starts off having a lot to say, but really limited means. But then uh, then it kind of sometimes can reverse where they their means or, or their abilities are. Uh, have expanded and grown and they can play a lot better but then what do they have to say or yet then they uh, they stop kind of limiting stop uh, whatever shaping themselves or forming it into something that's coherent and it just becomes this mush this, this you know, verbal whatever musical diarrhea or whatever <laughs> of, of people who can play too well <laughs> But did that happen to you guys? I mean, is there are there records? I mean, where you're just like, ah, we're too good. <laughs> <laughs> I think we kind of survived most of that by yeah. constantly kind of <clears throat> mutating or changing enough so that we were always a little bit off balance and slightly in uncomfortable, uh, slightly new, slightly new situation. So we never had the feeling like, oh, we're totally, we can do this in our sleep. It now, was never that, it was always the feeling that, well, I'm not quite sure I can pull this off. I'm not sure this is gonna work. So I heard radicalism, as I said, in James Brown, as well as in The Velvets, let's say. And uh, from, I heard, you know, what I thought were radical, cool ideas and sounds and things coming from 
Parliament Funkadelic, and also coming from uh, whatever, you know, Roxy Music or stuff like that. Um, those. I was aware, I mean, I'm not stupid. I'm aware that these groups sometimes had very different audiences, but at the same time, I wouldn't kind of differentiate. I, I heard exciting, radical things that were blowing my mind coming from what, especially in America, are completely different sides of the tracks. Uh, so they all came, they all went in. Not that it was my agenda, the band's agenda, or anything like this to kind of bridge <coughs> cultural or racial uh, barriers and bring separate audiences together or anything kind of altruistic like this. But occasionally it would kind of happen at some, in some venue. Uh, and you'd feel, feel pretty excited about it. But then the next town it wouldn't be happening. <laughs> yeah. and so it didn't seem like there was really uh, a whole, you know, widespread phenomenon. Uh, but if you just... But later on I found out that it, it did happen in another way. For instance, that I'll, maybe, you know, most of our audience was pretty white. But then I heard, you know, later on I'd find out that, say, uh, guys from the group Public, uh, Public Enemy really liked the record I did with Eno, which was really kind of an art record with a groove. And so there was, uh -huh. the things were kind of crossing over, but amongst musicians and producers and yeah, uh, that makes a lot kids of and stuff like that, instead of kind of the mass audience. And so then it came out kind of mixing and influences came out in their music and in stuff I was doing, but the audiences still weren't mixing as much. No wave, but there, it seemed to be a, there, that there had been a surge of uh, people with uh, very little craft making, making music that was deliberately um, noisy and abrasive, or whatever. Uh, I remember at, th at that point I was kind of touring on the road a lot, so I wasn't. I mean, I'd heard most of those bands. Had your record come out already, the first record? Yeah. What was the name of that one? 77. I still have to put a date on it. That Mark was the first like one. A marker. With Psycho Killer and uh -huh. all that stuff, yeah. It was an... Uh, basically that record was... An, making it was an unpleasant experience. As it might be for a lot of people first time in the studio. It felt like, basically, they don't understand us. <laughs> was that Eno involved with that one? No, he no. wasn't. Okay. So yeah, after that we started working with Eno and we felt like, here's somebody who understands us. Uh, and at first he didn't, you know, there was almost no interference meddling or whatever. Basically he just understood what we were doing and recorded us as, as, as we were. Or in your mind, what was happening when you were like, okay, now I'm a... I'm a rocker, or I'm a. I mean, no, you talk I about I that, or no? I don't remember any clear-cut point. I certainly remember there was a point where I realized that this was where all my energy was going, and it wasn't until. I mean, I was still doing some things, taking photographs and working on the record covers and doing this and that, but as far as any kind of art output, it became pretty pretty slim until later on when I, I found that I could do more, more things on stage 
and uh, direct some videos and that kind of thing. But that was later. Uh, but I, I never remember, I, I never really thought, well, I'm a rock and roll guy now, because I didn't feel like I fit in there either. Uh, and I occasionally would get their criticism of, oh, he's a dabbler, he's, uh, or that all these musicians are dabblers. They're, they're not serious. For them, the music is an art project. It's a, it's a, um, you got some that. kind of, it's some kind of performance art piece, but they're not really serious. You got that from the industry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even so though your records were selling really well and uh, yeah, they didn't sell that well at first. But yeah, even though they were, they were selling, they were doing, doing okay. And the band was, you know, at that point, really tight. And uh, however, kind of, kind of a whatever, herky jerky or skewed what we were doing was, it was for, as minimal as it was. It was played really well and really kind of accurately even though sometimes it was only a few notes. Yeah. Um, so there was, there was a lot of suspicion. There was a, a feeling of suspicion. Uh, probably the same kind of suspicion carried over to the no-wave people, I would imagine. But the, the, these are, these are uh, poets and artists and things who are trying to uh, we just want to be in a band as a thing. It's a, it's, a, it's a thing, but they'll get tired of it. They won't last. They're not really serious. <laughs> was it because? Which, which to me was just not. It was just not valid. I mean, anything you do is serious. I mean, it's you're, it's done. For the most part, it's done with conviction. Was that maybe the problem that you? Were you, because your, your video, now I wanted to like bridge a little bit into this other stuff about rock videos and, and you, you guys were obviously super visually literate. So maybe they were just like seeing that you were really interested, whereas other people might just go, oh, yeah, make the rock video or mm -hmm. make the, the, the record cover or something. And, but was it that you were so interested in all that other stuff or that they just didn't know how to approach? approach you guys somehow or they hadn't I, seen that because they hadn't it, seen that stuff yet they'd only seen a, I mean the whole stage look of you know these basically preppy looking kids uh, <laughs> and well what was that about stuff with no <laughs> what was that about yeah well not me but uh, some of the other ones were kind of preppy <laughs> so for them, that was their that was their regular clothes, uh, a Brooks Brothers shirt or something. Uh, I sometimes looked at that and thought, "What's well, a kind of strange?" You know, I was unfamiliar with that whole look, and I looked at it and go, "That's a kind. Of, it's a kind of strange look." But it, but in looking around, in the, in the world. Uh, People who look like that are become masters of the universe, or like in uh, Bonfire of the Van Vanities or whatever. Yeah. Um, these are the sons and daughters of privilege who are, and and that's the what you wear. So I thought all oh, that was really fascinating, <laughs> and very un rock and roll. Yeah. But it, for that kind of perverse reason, I thought it was kind of kind of great. <laughs> but it was also because it was like on this side of like actually having somebody in a suit. Like yes, which I did try at one point. At the one, big suit? No, the, no, no. Real early on, I thought, uh, I mean, I was, I was really thinking, I want to be every man. I want to look like just Mr. Mr. Go to work, regular guy. And I was, I think, working as a theater usher in Midtown in a movie theater. And I noticed that you know most of the people on the street uh, who had ambitions of being taken semi-seriously wore a suit. So I went to one of those discount places and bought a plaid, like a plaid polyester suit. <laughs> and that, 
I thought it was great until I threw it in the wash and then it just shrunk way down. Oh. Was, but I think I wore it on stage once. Uh, of course, it, <coughs> um, all, that st all that stuff is back again. But uh, again, it was an idea that I thought if you're going to be taken seriously and look like you really have something to say, uh, you got to look. You can't look like a rock and roll guy. Yeah. You got to look like a, uh, insinuate yourself, and in, in, in so you look like disguise yourself as Mr. Normal, and then you can say radical things, and um, people will take will listen to it because you don't look like some wild, crazy bohemian. How did that work? How do you think that worked for you guys? Did, were you able to insinuate yourself? Oh, it didn't work. That didn't work at all. They just thought you were <laughs> even weirder. Yes. Like, That's this guy. That whole idea was just totally bogus. <laughs> but still, it was an interesting idea. <laughs> wow, early 80s or something. Where some, somebody told me, hell, you, you should hear Can. Some of what you're doing sounds like... Sounds like them. You should check them out. So yeah, I checked out them. What's it? Noi. Some other oh, yeah. groups. That's interesting. That was. It was kind of after they'd already been doing it. <laughs> doing 1980. It well. Yeah, yeah. And it was kind of after. Uh, and it was kind of when. Yeah, there was some things that I was doing that were similar, but I didn't know it. Sure. I arrived at a kind of almost the same point from a different, by a different means. I thought rock videos made, changed them uh, for better and for worse. Um, sometimes for, for uh, there were instances of bands or musicians who did stuff that was only, only slightly interesting musically, but then they'd make a really interesting or great video. And uh, so you just felt like this is their their medium. They found their medium. Uh, they should be their video artists rather than, and the, the music they make is just the soundtrack for the for the video. And other and there's other people who you just felt this poor person is cursed now because they they have no clue how to swim in these waters. Oh, there's plenty of people who are. Uh, Making you know great music, but he knew had had no clue visually what to do with themselves. Yeah. And uh, you knew that in some ways they were going to get left by the you know, pushed to the side, left in the wayside, whatever. Uh, on the other hand. Uh, I, I thought it was really great at first. I thought here's, there's this whole pre-existing idea of kind of short experimental films, whether it's Stan Brackage or Bruce Conner or uh, the video, you know, artist videos or all this kind of stuff. And I thought, here's where this is going to go. This whole line of work is going to feed into rock videos as opposed to uh, the ones that look more like a Pepsi commercial, which, um, but that both, but it ended up both happened. <laughs> I mean, there's <laughs> you have both kind of coexisting, and then it kind of got more and more like everything looking like a um, Pepsi commercial. Come yeah, it became more of a formula it became more defined of this is what a video is. And at first, it, you didn't know what it was. So you could just make anything you well, wanted. Well, yeah, you, had, you knew you had to hold people's interest for the three minutes. But as far as anything else about it, it wasn't completely wide open, but it was fairly wide open. And the, you didn't have to have a super budget or incredible effects or any of that kind of stuff either. All these uh, artists and filmmakers whatever, who had for years, it, it had been the most, the, the kind of work that had the 
in a way the least audience. The, the, it had almost no outlet except for um, whatever, you know, Millennium Film places or anthology archives, that, uh, those kind of uh, film places, screening rooms or um, college film courses or whatever. And all of a sudden, this, this stuff, which had been relegated and kept totally on the fringe, uh, was going to be thrown right into pop culture, kind of into mass, become part of mass culture. And I thought that was kind of great, a great opportunity. It didn't quite happen that way, but sort of little bits of it did. You see influences of all those people, whether it's uh, video artists or Stan Brackett or Bruce Conner or <clears throat> all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, any of those people who are kind of doing nut nutty things. Did you work with any of those people or did you? I worked with Bruce Conner. Oh, wow. One, one thing. On one of the early ones or? Uh... It was a thing from the record I did with Eno. It made perfect sense because all the all our all the voices on the record were found voices, and he worked totally with found footage. Of course, he never cleared any of it. But so Bruce didn't. No. So you couldn't release it. Couldn't release it. Oh, no. <laughs> so it's not on anything. No, it's not on anything. I often think also that as that became more formulaic, then the it. Uh, it made, you know, the cycle just keeps going again of then pop music or rock or whatever uh, seems m less immediate, more artificial. It doesn't seem to connect as much, again, with people's lives um, once the style of the videos and the music is, is more kind of uh, a formula. And then, once again, then, people's outlet becomes live performance. So uh, bands became more outrageous. And the live performance was almost a reaction to that, the slickness of the, uh, the video, whatever, video culture. In the way that the British punk scene was this whole package of the look, the attitude, the music, and all the, uh, Videos had that effect on American music, where the, um, it had to, all the pieces of that puzzle had to fit in order for it to uh, really get over. Um, Interesting. A band, uh, in some ways, in different styles, say, uh, from Nirvana to run DMC or whatever, uh, the picture had to match the, the look and the attitude and the sound and you know, everything had to uh, belong together. And if it didn't, then yeah, it was like, what's wrong with this picture? But at first it was really... Uh, I remember my aesthetic was to strip away all extraneous things to that uh, the rule book that every uh, that there shouldn't be uh, the kind of traditional hierarchy uh, of kind of melody and then everything else just basically is there to support the melody. Every instrument should be doing something that that, that you can listen to, uh, have its own kind of integrity. And then you put, all, you put it all together and it makes something else. But it's not like, oh, it's, this is basically a boring part, but it, um, but it, it supports, the, it, it exists to support the melody. Uh, I felt like everything should be sort of autonomous. I didn't feel like the guitar was the, I knew it was this kind of icon, whether it's phallic or whatever else, 
in this, in, but it also has this whole very 50s, all the guitars have this kind of 50s iconography, which uh, to me, there, it was like, uh, by, by associating yourself with this kind of iconography, you're associating yourself with a, an, a particular era of American culture. Even kind of modern guitars, where it's made out of plastic or whatever, they still looked kind of 50s, early 60s in the, the shapes, those kind of boomerang shapes and everything. Uh, to me, so it, it had, it always had this re reference back to a, uh, an earlier era or to an earlier part of American culture or to some kind of bizarre, kitschy American roots, whether it meant like uh, boomerang coffee tables or, and at the same time, Little Richard and Elvis and everything else. Like it was connecting the, the boomerang coffee table in the suburban tract house with uh, the music, yeah, this kind of funky, rootsy music, but then all that was, to me, implicit in just the shape of the guitar. <laughs> wow. Talk about visual thinking. <laughs> so you were, uh, in a way, always carrying a little piece of your roots with you. You could never be, you could never jettison them and be totally 100% modern. Uh, what of other aesthetics was uh, not to try and sound black, uh, no, um, not to try. <laughs> I remember in the early early days, uh, not to dance. That there was because, uh, or not to have moves, you know, like whatever that would be. Uh, I mean, moves of this kind of thing, or uh, <laughs> whatever, any kind of move. There was that; uh, they were all out. I mean, you, until fi you found something that wasn't uh, barred or carried over from kind of a typical rock thing. You had to just you had, you had no choice but to throw everything out and stand as still as possible. Okay. <laughs> so it was really like a ground zero band. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that was the idea. Yeah. Uh, build it up block by block, and so that every block that you add, you believe in 100%, and you understand it, and you can totally, it has integrity, and you, uh, your stamp of approval is on it, and you can totally endorse each thing that you're adding. But I, I liked the idea of that kind of rigorous, sometimes in the lyrics, I liked the idea of putting, having lyrics that were in a way like that, kind of rigorously uh, apoetic, kind of clunky sounding, or sounded like, sounded like a, an instruction manual or a Marxist textbook or, or some kind of scientific thing or, or some kind of psycholo something out of a psychological book or didn't sound like song lyrics but that <laughs> but that uh, somehow you could find emotion in, in it and really intense emotion uh, it was almost like well you couldn't really sing the phone book but you know, it was, uh, you were taking something that was cold and then putting a, a hot fire under it. And uh, so you weren't singing, the words weren't saying, I'm fucked up or I'm angry or I'm, I'm, uh, or, you know. I'm afraid of people in Chicago or whatever, but the uh, the words would be saying 
something really cool, but in with your voice and with the uh, intent, the intensity of the performance, you'd be saying all these very emotional, personal things. So it had this. I thought that was great that uh, you could have that kind of s strange tension. How do you look back on it now? I mean, do you see it as totally perverse? Just, <laughs> it's just like, where did you come up with that shit? <laughs> I think, you know, it's a shame those ideas are, you were so single-minded about folk just rejecting anything outside of the, that direction that uh, it's a shame because I can never be that, that completely single-minded again, I don't think. I like too many things now, whereas then it was the thing where in order to hang on to some kind of identity and self-worth or whatever, you had to just kind of throw, reject everything. No, I hate that, I hate that, I hate that, I hate that. I can't, I can't stand rock and roll. I, but we're going to save it by, by destroying it. Well, I just started hearing more and liking more and more things and not, <coughs> not being, uh, I mean, I guess I, at that point I added a few more blocks to that I could stand on, so I wasn't going to be. Uh, I could allow other things in, and they weren't going to knock me over. They weren't going to totally overwhelm me. And I could also be selective about what I uh, what I allowed in. That I. Um, if I said I liked Brazilian music, I didn't have to like everything. I, it would just be a ridiculous statement, but I could hear selective things that were, I thought, you know, beautiful but radical. I feel uh, a lot in common with whatever the, uh, the sound lab crowd and you know, people who were DJs who were mixing all kinds of stuff together, uh, adding lots of different kinds of music, and uh, musicians in different parts of the world who were doing that same kind of thing, sampling one thing and adding something else and mixing something else in. Often their sources and, and references are coming from all over the place, partly due to sampling, but partly that is, so I can guess, and also inspires them to, to play things sometimes that are, or to sing with references for coming from all over. That feels, uh, I feel at home in that, that, uh, what, that attitude. So I feel like, hey, hey, okay, the window's open again for another minute or two. Your stuff sold like really the huge, right? I mean, I don't know. Some of it did. Some not so much, but some, some did pretty mm -hmm. well. <coughs> but I always felt that was just a, uh, just a fluke. That uh, it was like the, the stream of uh, my, the, a certain part of my interest being kind of pop or whatever, or popular and the, a certain percentage of the public being interested and in, that kind of meets at some point and then just crosses and then doesn't meet again and then maybe crosses again at another point but it was I always thought it was always just kind of fluke there was uh, not something that I could ever hone, hone or, or try for or design or articulate. The problem then is with, with so much stuff coming out, so much stuff available and so many things, you know, whether it's in the net or in the media or a million TV channels or whatever, the problem is uh, having filters, being able to put, get some kind of blinders and clo close your, or close your sight down and your sound down and focus on what's really going to 
has some meaning for you, whether you rely on some reviews in a magazine, do that, or your friend, word of mouth from your friends, or a net search, or whatever. The, yeah, the thing is, how, how do you find what's, what's meaningful for you? Um, you can kind of extract meaning from anything, from kind of pure, <laughs> pure shit, you can kind of, I mean, you know, even just pure pop garbage has all, has grains of, what, of genius and inspiration in it that you can, you know, if that's all you have available to you, you can kind of extract some kind of uh, S juice out of it. I mean, there was a, a period where people were going, oh, video, video cameras are cheap and uh, everybody's going to be making movies now. Every, every Joe Blow on the street is going to uh, start making movies and they'll put them on public access and it'll be like a, a revolution. It just never happened. Uh, with music, it's a little closer. I mean, to everybody with a, a sampler and some turntables or a guitar and whatever is, has got a CD out there somewhere. I was really afraid that if I did more, uh, any art exhibitions, I would just take an incredible amount of shit uh, as being the reverse from before. This would be, now it would be the shoes on the other foot, would be rock musician thinks he can be an artist. And did you think of your, you know, the rock videos and the album covers or the... Yeah, I thought character? that was that was an outlet. That was a visual outlet. Sure. You know, and whether it was that or staging or big suit on stage or any of that kind of stuff, I thought, okay, it's, it's getting art. out. Yeah, this is my art. It's getting out one way or another. Yeah. There was that moment at the, kind of in the punk scene and no wave scene where it really did seem like a lot of uh, people out of art school, or with that sensibility at least, were picking up or being, being a band or being a musician or something. And then five years later, uh, when it was the, the whole painting boom of uh, Kind of the East Village scene and the Julian Schnabel and that whole scene. I remember seeing musicians who were all of a sudden picking up paintbrushes. I was real happy that I think some of the local kids from that area found it kind of entertaining. Uh, I guess I'm really stuck on the idea that. That uh, that I, I gotta keep gotta keep them gotta keep them entertained a little bit, uh, and then uh, then you can slip in the kind of subversive stuff, or whatever. I won't go that I won't go very far with it. You know, I, I'll draw the line. You mean with the entertainment? Yeah, quality with the entertainment of, yeah. quality of it certainly draw the line at one point and go, no, I don't go any further than this. Bright colors, <laughs> pretty, <laughs> pretty bright colors, uh, kind of moody sounds, whatever. Uh, I think those are almost like biological things. Uh, it's like, you know, if there's a nice groove in, a, in music, uh, Eno and I found you can almost put anything on, on top once you have an interesting kind of groove and bed. Were you brought up Catholic or uh, Protestant or? Probably what? Protestant. Not really, but I come from Scotland, so it's a. Oh yeah. Protestant uh, state of mind. Even if you weren't brought up that way, I think you get you kind of get it. So I'm 
I think part of music is a struggle to free myself from that. That uh, music is a kind of self-healing thing in that way of trying to, uh, yeah, kind of counterbalance that those tendencies. Which would be what are the tendencies like? Um, Oh, it's, you know, it's, uh, well, I'm totally generalizing, but kind of the Protestant thing would be that, uh, you know, hard work is good for you. Pleasure is always suspect. Anything that gives you pleasure is, if it's not the devil's work, it's, just, it could be close to it. <laughs> and, uh, the, That uh, there's probably more stuff than that. Those are the the main ones, and a kind of you know kind of a reserve, an emotion, totally total emotional reserve. Uh, um, but that's ready to to explode at any moment. It's very kind of it's very northern. I think all those northern countries have that. Were you born there? Yeah. You were born there. Oh, okay. And then you came here at what time, what age? I was young. Finally moved to Canada when I was two and then to the States when I was eight. A, a, a great gospel church service is, is a rock con it's like a rock concert. Yeah. And vice versa. A rock concert is a is a church service in a sense. In Europe recently, I was only aware that the rave scene had all these spiritual overtones. People would always talk about it, that they were going into trance, that they were, they were uplifted, they would lose themselves in the beat, that they became one with this, the big throbbing mass of humanity, all in ecstasy. Yeah. Uh, so it was all, it was total, everything, even the graphics, it's all very kind of uh, spiritual in some sense. I mean, it might seem new agey or hokey or whatever, but it all is, it's all, that's, that's the kind of language and visuals that everybody, that it's part of. But it's not happening here so much, is it? No, mm. they say it's because the drug never caught on. Ecstasy. Yeah, that that it never that n never became the kind of thing that uh, suburban kids would on weekends would pop some ecstasy and, and rave all night. It's whereas I think in England and wherever Ibiza and all those places it'd just be. The, it's, a lot of it is just regular, regular kids going out for the weekend. That whole phenomena of just getting, just this pulsing beat, uh, and getting lost in this throbbing mass of humanity, is really attractive. Yeah, definitely. I think. Uh, but and I, I think it's more attractive than the same kind of thing that happens at a rock concert. Because in a rock concert, I'm always uh, I'm put off by the fact that there's this demigod on the stage, you know, like whatever, and and all the the pulsing beat and the, and the, everybody's adulation has a focus. Whereas on the raves and things, there's no focus, there's no center, no focus. Everybody's just part of this uh, unfocused blob. Yeah, <laughs> this human amoeba. Yeah, I find that it doesn't. The strict techno stuff for me doesn't swing. So, so I can't groove to it. it doesn't have. There any, you go. That's it, it doesn't have any syncopations. <laughs> Whereas if there's, a, if it's a funky beat, I can listen to it for hours, and that's cool. <laughs>